1967, I moved from Auburn University with my family to Purdue, where I became a campus pastor there. In the spring of 1968, during spring break, I had decided, this was of course at the time of the Civil Rights Movement, and I had decided that it would be good for the students at Purdue uh, to understand a little bit of the dynamic of the South. I had grown up there, and so I organized a group of about 16, and we headed to Alabama. We stopped at Nashville for the Grand Ole Opera. We met with some educators and politicians in North Alabama. And then we headed south to G's Bend. G's Bend was the home of the uh, newly formed Freedom Quilting Bee, uh, where some of the African-American women had started making quilts and were selling them uh, as a way of helping to survive. The enterprise had been uh, initiated and encouraged by a young Episcopal minister who was working with a civil rights organization. We got to G's Bend. G's Bend is, is about 25 miles south of Selma, Alabama. And it's where the Alabama River takes a, one of those large bends. It was the site of the cotton plantations in the old days. And as the plantations uh, diminished and people moved away, some of the black folks stayed in the area. It was a poor, isolated area. But it was the home of the Freedom Quilting Bee, and we wanted to see for ourselves what they were doing. We were met by Eugene and Estelle Witherspoon. Uh, Eugene met us uh, at his house and took us around to the well immediately. And we had a kind of communion. Uh, we all stood around the well. He lowered the bucket into the well and brought up a bucket full of cool, clear water. And then he took the gourd dipper down that was hanging on the well filled it full of water, and we passed around and drank. It was a wonderful welcome. And then Eugene took us over to where the women were uh, quilting, and we watched them. One of the women told us that uh, they figured it was the way they were selling their quilts at the time that they probably had gotten up to maybe five cents an hour for their labor. We bought a couple of quilts uh, for the campus ministry, Center. And then we were getting ready to leave, and it was about uh, 4.30, 5 o'clock, and we were scheduled to go into Mobile that afternoon, that evening, when Eugene said, why don't you all just spend the night? Well, Steve was the other campus minister with me, and he had grown up in uh, northern New Jersey. Um, he was well aware that we were the only white folks in that area, and because of the nature of the, of the uh, situation, uh, he was justifiably um, nervous. But I thought it might be a good lesson and we could take the risk. He sidled up to me and said, Max, I don't think this is a good idea. I think we need to get on the road. And I said, Steve, just relax. Let's see where this goes. So I said to Eugene, I think we'll do that. Well, he was delighted, as were the women, and uh, all of a sudden, people came out, almost came out of the woodwork. And because our houses were so small, it was, it was not possible for all of us to stay in one place, and so different people hosted uh, two by two the group. Steve and I wound up staying with the Witherspoons. When we settled in after we had had supper, um, I said, now we don't want to keep you up too late. And Eugene said, oh, we stay up late all the time. And uh, I said, uh, how late do you stay up? Oh, he said, sometimes we stay up to 8.30. Well, we got the head. 
We went to bed. Uh, Eugene had explained um, the chamber pot, as it's called in more polite circles, I guess, the slop jar that was under the bed and its purposes. Uh, and so we bedded down and about one, two o'clock in the morning, Steve woke up and his natural urges hit. And I don't know whether it was because he was had forgotten what the uh, slop jar was for or whether he was too embarrassed to use it or what, but anyhow, he decided to, to uh, go to the outhouse. We had spotted that, of course, when we were coming in. Uh, he was barefooted. <clears throat> it was a cool night. Uh, the ground uh, around the house, uh, no grass. Um, it was kept clean with a brush broom. And the Witherspoons had chickens that were not pinned up. So when Steve, in the dark, stepped off the porch, he hit that cool, bare ground, and then with a couple of steps, he stepped into what the chickens had left as a reminder. And it so startled him that he started running uh, for the outhouse. And the clothesline caught him right under the, uh, run under the eyes, it turned out. Well, during all the commotion, I went out, I, I woke up and went out to see what was happening. And I got there and got... Uh, Steve picked up and examined the eye, and it was just a little cut. It wasn't too serious. Um, so he went, did his business. I went back in, and after a while, we bedded down. The interesting thing about that is that neither Eugene or uh, Estelle woke up, uh, apparently knew what was going on. About 5.30 in the morning, I woke, I could hear, I could hear the radio and I could smell the bacon frying. And I could hear Eugene singing along with the radio. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I fly away to a home on that celestial shore. I fly away, I fly away, oh glory. I fly away to my home on that celestial shore. I fly away. I can still hear it. I can still smell the bacon frying. We had hot biscuit and eggs and bacon and grits, of course. Most of the food came from surplus commodities. Poor, simple breakfast, but the hospitality was absolutely elegant. Well, after breakfast, we got all the group back together and they said all their goodbyes to the host and we headed back uh, northeast. We stopped into Funiac Springs where a friend of mine was the pastor of a church there and he and his wife hosted us for the night and we were out in the backyard uh, throwing frisbees and and uh, eating barbecue when Eddie, his wife, said, I think you better come in the house <coughs> and watch television. Uh, we went inside and the television station was broadcasting from Memphis, Tennessee. And when we came in and sat around, the commentator was saying, that Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. had been assassinated. We were stunned and absolutely silent. We planned to go to Tuskegee Institute the next day. That, of course, a black institution where George Washington Carver had taught and worked. And I called a friend of mine over there and I said, what do you think? And he said, Max, any other time, there would be absolutely no problem. But the people here are so hurt and so angry, I'm not sure it's the best thing to do. And so we cut that part of our trip short and went home to Purdue. 
I listened as the students later told those stories and shared the stories of that trip. And they talked about Nashville and they talked about Huntsville and, um, and all the experiences that we had on the way. And they spoke about the, uh, the night King was assassinated. But the one story that came up over and over again was the night that we spent in G's Bend. It made an indelible impression on the people who participated, who were there. I can still hear Eugene. I can still see the well and taste the water that came out of that dipper. It was a real touch of Southern hospitality in the midst of one of the most tense periods in our history.